Hi, Anthony, and welcome listeners of Exploring the BioEdge. Today, we tackling part three of our Pampas puzzles. And as I understand it, we'll be looking at the animals that weigh less than a thousand kilograms um, and occurred on in the Pampas landscape more than 10,000 years ago. Our previous episodes looked at why there are no trees in the Pampas, and we need to come back to that, Anthony. We haven't actually provided a solid uh, hypothesis for that. We just looked at the question. And then in the second part of Pampas puzzles, we looked at the megafauna. So now we're going one below the megafauna. Looking forward to it. Over to you. Yes, well, just to um, remind uh, listeners of the context, what we're dealing with is Buenos Aires province in the country of Argentina. And um, we're looking at a period more than 10,000 years ago when the climate of what is now the Pampas, a, a sea of grassland, was somewhat drier than it is today, which means that it was probably some kind of open savanna. And at that time, uh, the climate was drier, mainly because the sea was much further to the east than it is today, which means that the rain-bearing winds had less access to what is now Buenos Aires province. There's a broad coastal shelf east of Buenos Aires province, which means that during the lower sea levels of the Pleistocene, the coastal shelf was widely exposed, probably for hundreds of kilometers out to sea, which means that the area we're looking at, uh, which is now the Pampas, was a somewhat different savanna ecosystem. But nonetheless, um, the fossils allow us to compare the fauna at that time, at the end of the Pleistocene, just before humans arrived, with what is there today. And the main point that we've been making is that it's impossible to imagine a greater difference in those faunas. It's impossible to imagine a greater disparity between the mind-bogglingly impressive um, mammalian fauna of the protopampus of the late Pleistocene and the ridiculously, uh, shall we say, um, vacated uh, fauna of the current pampas of the Holocene, which consisted basically of more or less nothing but rodents. So we've covered the mega herbivores, and now let's go on to the mesofauna, if you like, or the um, medium to large mammals ranging from 20 kilograms up to about 999 kilograms. And the first thing one notices when one looks at the at the fauna as established by the, the fossil evidence is how um, diverse it is. It's so diverse that it's quite difficult actually to list all of the mammals that were there. And so faced with the, the complexity of it, what, what I think we should do is we should try to frame this uh, discussion in terms of a kind of a search image in which we compare the, um, the mesofauna, as it were, of the protopampus with Plains game faunas elsewhere in the world, because this is a is a typical plains situation in the sense that it's flat with grass, and it's got many large animals. So let us ask ourselves: How does the South American example of a plains ecosystem, broadly similar in vegetation to the Serengeti, you know, grass with scattered trees, possibly including acacias, um, how does it compare with with Holocene or modern plains game situations, such as the Serengeti, such as Yellowstone, um, such as perhaps some of the um, savannas in northwestern India, where we, we really understand how the, the fauna is constructed and particularly how the um, ungulates were predated by various carnivores. Now, the first thing one notices in terms of that framing is that the glaring lack in the case of the protopampas was that ruminants were downplayed. Most of the, the, the plains game ecosystems of the modern world revolve around ruminants. In the Serengeti, it's wildebeests. In West Africa, it was a corrigum, which is a, an alsalafian relative of wildebeests. In the South African high felt, it was a combination of alsalafians, wildebeests, blessbok, and gazelles, the springbok. Um, the eland usually plays a part in most of these ecosystems. When it comes to North America, the main plains game ruminants were the bison and um, the pronghorn, and to some degree, the deer, the large cursorial deer called the wapiti. So ruminants really run plains game ecosystems, and in turn, it is the ruminants on which most of the predation is based, whether it be by uh, large felids, such as the lion, 
or the gregarious uh, group hunting canids, such as the African hunting dog, or in the case of North America, the modern wolf. So that's the search image. And, and against that search image, the pampas is even more remarkable than it would otherwise be because um, what we find in the protopampas is that ruminants, although present, are downplayed to the point that there's no credible phenomenon there in the late Pleistocene of um, extremely gregarious, migratory, mobile, large ruminants that were abundant enough to characterize the plains game ecosystem. And instead, what we had was a, a type of, of, of faunal element that has no place in the modern world on any continent, and that is the xenarthrin, or shall we say edentate, that's the old term, um, radiation that consists of ground sloths, pumpatheas, and glyptodonts, all of which are completely different from any plains game fauna in the Holocene because they are so slow, so slow in metabolism, in movement, in reproduction, in growth, and even in thought, because they're small brains, uh, with low body temperatures, that they don't seem to fit into a plains game ecosystem. When we think of plains game, whether it's the Highfelt or the Serengeti or, or Yellowstone, we think of a hectic ecosystem. Things move fast. Um, and and uh, that's the excitement of it, really, is that you're dealing with fast moving creatures, fleet of foot, hoofed animals, things like a cheetah, which specialize on gazelles, which are extremely fleet footed animals. Now, that kind of phenomenon wasn't really there in the protopampus of the late Holocene in Buenos Aires province, except for one major uh, element, and that is the horses. They, they are the exception that break the rule in this, or maybe prove the rule in some sense, but they certainly break the rule because not only was the modern zebra genus, zebra genus, equus, which is the same genus as the horse, and indeed the same genus as the ass and the donkey, not only was that there, uh, but there was another equid there as well. And so you not only had something like a zebra, a rather large version of it, because that particular zebra um, uh, was, was about 400 kilograms in body mass, which is larger than any modern zebra. But there was also an equid genus called Hippidion, with a, a rather strange skull in which the nasal bones were strangely lifted higher than they are in, in other horses. And so there, were, there was not one but two lineages of equid uh, plains game in the protopampas. And that's that's odd because nowhere in the modern world, shall we say, nowhere in the Holocene do we know of any plains game ecosystem that really had two equids together. In Africa, it's really just the plains zebra species, Equus quacha, that takes part more or less as a second fiddle to antelopes um, in, in that ecosystem. The, the, the plains zebra is abundant in some uh, plains game situations in Africa, but it's not present in the Indian situation. It was not at all present in the Holocene in North America, and it wasn't even present present in, in the West African examples, where the mm. corrigum was the main migratory alsa uh, Thanks, and I, I realize you still need to set the context further because there are a lot more animals to discuss, but um, if I could just jump in with a burning question, and that is, I'm trying to imagine what it would be like as a tourist in in that pampas, proto pampas era. How enjoyable would the tourist experience be relative to being in the Serengeti? Uh, you know, would you be you, tourists in the Serengeti are blown away by the experience of seeing so many tens of thousands of wildebeest go past their Land Rover and the lions moving after them and the hyenas after them, after the, uh, the wildebeest as well. Um, what would the experience be in the in that proto pampas? Do you think there would be, you know, as many horses to watch? And um, which tourist would be most impressed? Uh, I think it's helpful imagining how we would perceive the um, the landscape as uh, as tourists interested in mammal viewing. But then another question is, it's it's odd for me that the Serengeti would be have a system that's 
has faster animals in it because we tend our, our thoughts on how ecology operates what the main drivers are we tend to go back to soils and nutrients and um yes parts of the serengeti are very rich and from a soil perspective but the pampas is as we've discussed in series one exceptionally nutrient rich so i would have thought that would enable animals to have a, a fast metabolism and be fleet-footed uh, i would have guessed that it was the pampas with even faster animals um and is the fact that it's horses, equids dominating the pampas being hind gut fermenters, is, is that perhaps related to the nutrient richness of the pampas soil that they don't need to digest the food as um, thoroughly as uh, non hind gut fermenters? Um, just trying to form a view, a hypothesis as to why uh, the ungulates on, uh, were kept out of the protopampus and the horses were able to dominate. Yep. Sorry, lots yeah, of questions. All, in all of those ideas are fascinating and, and, and well-based. And um, the question of what it is about the equid digestive system that may or may not suit it to the pampas is, I think, something we should um, reserve for a complete discussion in its own right, because it's quite complicated to analyze. But um, okay. coming back to your other point about... Um, about pace of life in general, I simply don't understand why it is that even the most fertile ecosystems in North America and South America had ground sloths and glyptodons until the end of the Pleistocene. Um, there is an anomaly there because, as you say, the fertility of those ecosystems should promote rapid pace of life. And yet we find these elements that are um, so slow in pace of life that they would seem to fit better in a place like Australia, which has, you know, wall to wall deficient soils. Um, nobody would have been surprised to find these kinds of animals in the fossil record in Australia, but to find them in the pampas is truly a puzzle. And the only uh, clue I can give listeners now, which I encourage listeners to think on this deeply, but the only kind of clue I can give right now is that over time, over evolutionary history, for some strange reason, there's been a quickening. So we went from the, the time of the, of the reptiles, the ruling reptiles, through to the time of the mammals and birds. And because mammals and birds have faster pace of life than reptiles, there was a quickening there. And now we're in the Anthropocene where there's an enormous quickening because of fossil fuels. And even within the, the evolution of the mammals over possibly 60 million years since the uh, Cretaceous, there's been a quickening in the sense that uh, ever fleeter footed larger brained and apparently more metabolically active animals have replaced their predecessors. So there just seems to be something in nature's plan for evolution that has a, an inbuilt um, pattern of quickening in it, which mm. is deeply puzzling from an ecological point of view because you should not have that sort of emergence going on. Ideally, natural selection should operate with the environment as it is. And so yeah. a fertile environment in the Cretaceous should have produced gazelles and cheetahs but it mm. didn't maybe there were no fertile environments in the cretaceous i can't say but what we can say is that the um the protopampas in south america was probably extremely fertile in the pleistocene as it is today and yet for some unknown reason there was not only a, a selective pressure for um, mammals with slow pace of life but there was an astonishing diversity of these creatures we've already seen in in, in part um mm. two that even just within the category of mega herbivores we had several families and 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 various genera of ground sloths and uh glyptodonts and the same is true for the the smaller ones again with the with the ground sloths alone um between 20 and and 999 kilograms there were no less than four families and even more genera and then when it comes to the to the glyptodonts, there were um, six genera, all living in that protopampus together. Heaven knows how they separated ecologically. I just cannot imagine how, you know, six species of ground sloths or seven species of ground sloths and and you know an equivalent number of glyptodonts, all of which were herbivores, slow moving, were mm. somehow carving up niche space in what was basically just a a fairly uniform savanna on a on a plain. So that's yeah. a major. So there's two major problems with, with these xenarthrans in the protopampus. One is their slowness, 
Uh, and the other one is their sheer radiation, their, their ridiculous diversification and their carving of, of niche space in a way that we have no modern analog to compare with. Now, coming back to your other brilliant idea, which is to frame this discussion um, along the lines of uh, imagining imagining a tour company um, trying to draw people away, scramble time a little and imagine that uh, 15,000 years ago is, is, is as accessible as, as right now and try and draw our international audience of wildlife tourists away from the rather um, over trammeled Serengeti into something slightly more interesting, but no less adventurous and, and hectic in the form of the Pampas and try to uh, highlight the key attractions of this ecosystem for the tourists. Now, one of the attractions would be the sheer diversity of the Xenarthrans, but uh, that's not going to stick very well because the way one would have experienced, I suspect, these Xenarthran um, uh, herbivores, whether they were in the medium size range or the extremely large size range, is basically just as lumps lying around. They probably slept most of the time and even, <laughs> even, even if in full view, just looked like a lump. Not very exciting. Um, mm. So... And of course, they would have been subject to predation, and we'll go into that in terms of the of the local form of the dire wolf, which is much more interesting than it may sound. But there wasn't a whole lot going on apart from the predation on these xenarthrans. So um, those tourists, the, those yeah. tourists would, would drive past those xenarthrans pretty quickly, much like one drives past Impala in the Kruger Park without batting an eyelid. You're looking for something else. Yes, but I suspect the, the reasons for driving past them would be different because impalas are actually very engaging and bright and uh, active and, and, and you know, uh, fascinating creatures to watch. Uh, whereas the Xenarthrans probably would be about as interesting as it is to watch a modern extant sloth in an Amazonian forest, which is basically you're going to go to sleep because there's nothing really <laughs> happening. Um, yeah. So, yeah. so but, but that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that we can't compete with our Serengeti clientele because there were enough hectic animals in this proto-pampas ecosystem uh, to provide stiff competition for the Serengeti. Not only have we seen that there was a spectacular cat in the form of Smilodon populator, um, for which there's no real competition in the Serengeti. The lion can't really compete with this animal for sheer spectacular dramatic appeal. But there were several other carnivores, including a deep-faced bear, about the size of a modern lion or bigger, about 250 kilograms. And there were no less than three forms of canid predator, um, starting with the so-called dire wolf, which isn't a wolf at all, by the way. It's a completely dif different canid lineage in the genus Enos, uh, Inosion, or Enosion, which was uh, truly impressive because it was about double the body mass of the modern wolf and with a much, uh, proportionately much stronger set of jaws. Um, but there were also two other canid predatory genera in the protopampas, um, one called uh, protocanus and pro protocyon and the other one called ducicyon. And they were each about 30 kilograms in body mass, which is bigger than the African hunting dog and about the same size as the modern wolf. So uh, nothing to be ashamed of there. Plenty of large carnivores to keep us busy. And they would have had prey that they would be hunting in full view of the tourists in the form mainly of these zebras and hippidions but also in the form of the um, the token ruminants of the ecosystem. When I say token ruminants, what do I mean? Well, there were no less than uh, six genera of ruminants in the protopampus, consisting of three genera of deer and, and three genera of camelids, in addition to a mega, herbiv mega herbivorous camelid. So um, you, you've got those kinds of ruminants, but they're not true plains grain ruminants because... Um, the deer were not of the sort that forms large mobile aggregations along the lines of African antelopes. They're more the kinds of deer that survive in South America today, like the marsh deer, rather solitary skulking animals. And when it comes to the camelids, they're kind of apologies for a ruminant because they don't really have proper hoofs. They don't really have a completely formed ruminant digestive system. And all camelids tend to have rather slow pace of life for modern ungulate animals. Okay, so it's a case of so near and yet so far. It's so easy to imagine dialing up the ruminant presence in the protopampas, not only by applying natural selection to the camelids, uh, including llama-like animals, um, and, and the deer, 
but also just by simply importing the uh, impressive bowids from North America, which could have freely walked across the isthmus at Panama and just colonized South America in much the same way as did many others, such as um, the zebras themselves, as well as 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 the the the, the felids and and the um, the canids. So we know that many animals that lived in the Protopampas came from North America. No problem. They just basically walked down there over a period. And yet for some incomprehensible reason, no bovid of any sort has ever reached South America. Now we're talking, when we say bovid, we're talking about buffaloes, antelopes, bovines, and so on. These are the animals that dominate not just plains game ecosystems everywhere else besides Australia, but that um, are, are basically ubiquitous in the rest of the world, uh, again, barring Australia. So the whole of North America, the whole of Eurasia, the whole of Africa, the whole of India, and even Sri Lanka is full of bovids. And yet, and, and they, were, they were widespread in North America in the form of, of bovines like the bison and caprons like the bighorn sheep. But for some incomprehensible reason, they just simply never reached South America, leaving a great big vacuum, as it were, in the Proto-Pampas. That vacuum has been filled instead by xenarthrins, uh, which have a much slower pace of life than the bovids. So that's perhaps the biggest mystery of all. I mean, it's difficult to know which to pick. You know, you're kind of spoiled for choice when you're looking at the biggest mystery of the protopampus. But one of the biggest mysteries of the protopampus is the absolute lack of bovids, by which I mean bovines and antelopes. Anything like a wildebeest, anything like a bison, anything like a pronghorn, anything like a, um, um, a, a wapiti. Do you think the horses were out competing them? I'm going to press you on coming up with a hypothesis. <laughs> yes, well, that is possible. It's possible that Equus, the zebra or the horse, and Hippidion, the kind of rather strange other horsey animal, were so abundant and so successful that they usurped the niche of bovids. But that doesn't quite ring true to me, because you do have quite a degree of coexistence in Africa between the two groups. There's no doubt mm. that in a general com sense, competitively in the modern world, equids are um, subordinate to bovids. Yeah. But um, but but there, there's still something to be explained in there. Um, so so anyway, to come back to the, the question of 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 the of the sort of um, appeal to travelers of the yeah. pampas, I think. What I would tout if I was if I was sort of uh, designing an advert to lure people away from the Serengeti, I would obviously focus on the carnivores, which are easily as spectacular as those in the Serengeti, although of different kinds. Instead of a cheetah, we've got a long, a, a deep jawed bear. Um, instead of the African hunting dog, we've got a much bigger and and deeper jawed uh, dire wolf, you know, Sion Neringi. Um, Instead of the lion, we've got the the uh, much larger, brawnier, and and longer toothed uh, Smilodon populator. Um, so, if anything, I think the Protopampus would win out in that competition. Um, but when it comes to the the um, the herbivores, um, uh, I think I think the way what I would focus on is the sheer oddness of some of the um, more important herbivores, such as the lip, litop tern. Um, there, there was a, a there were two lit, lit up turns in the protopampas, which were these odd autochthonously South American kind of paraungulates or pseudoungulates, which were odd enough and large enough, 800 kilos, 1,000 kilos, but they had no real counterparts in the Serengeti, and possibly had very interesting anti-predator uh, relationships with with their predators, and also you know other odd things like for example. Um, uh, there was a, a large rodent there, um, a kind of a proto capybara, if you like, which was about 100 kilograms, about double the body mass of the modern capybara, that possibly just grazed out in the open, again, um, as, as, a, as a sort of uh, proxy for a plains game. And, and that's of some interest because you just don't find large rodents of that sort just acting as grazers out in the open anywhere in the world today. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Uh and, and the abundance of the equid herds, you know, that, well, that's a great appeal in the Serengeti is just seeing wildebeest to the horizon. Would do you think that would have happened in the pampas with with other with the horses or not? 
there's no way to say. Um, there's no line of evidence could, that could um, could elucidate that really, you know, because we have fossils, but they tell us nothing about that. I mean, we have to assume that given that we're dealing with the same genus, I mean, this is a, an amazing thing to think about. In the Protopampus in deep South America, more than 10,000 years ago, there was an animal that you can basically simply call a zebra. We have no idea whether it was striped or not. It doesn't matter. It's in the same genus Equus. It's in the same genus as the domestic horse and the domestic donkey. It's a very familiar animal. We know how it operates. There's not going to be that much leeway within a genus. So we know pretty much what that animal was like. And so it, it was obviously gregarious. Uh, it may not have been as much specialized for grazing as modern um, Equus are because it's within the repertoire of a horse to browse, you know, so it may have browsed a bit, um, but you can just call it a, a zebra. And so that was obviously probably gregarious, fleet footed. It was particularly large for a zebra, so that is pretty spectacular. And we can assume that it had, it had fairly long range movements because most of the big populations of the plain zebra today um, or in the recent past have been, if not migratory, then certainly um, you know, far ranging in their movements. So that's a very modern phenomenon. And um, and it, it, if, it, if it, it was true that they were particularly abundant and filled in for the bovid plains game, then perhaps they were twice as abundant as they are in the, you know, in the uh, the modern African settings. But it's impossible to say. And I, I, I suspect it's simply unknowable. I can't imagine any investigation that could really shed light on that. Yeah, uh, and perhaps another interesting attraction for tourists would be the interactions between, for example, the saber-toothed tiger, Smilodon, and the wolf and, and the other predators with the xenothrans and the glyptodons, um, the sloths and the armadillo-like animals. Uh, you know, an, an analogy is perhaps in the Kruger Park, you occasionally come across a leopard attacking a porcupine or a lion attacking a porcupine. Um, it's a it's a long battle and, and normally the predator doesn't actually win. Um, or a, a lion or a leopard attacking a honey badger. Again, it's kind of an even contest. And I, I would imagine that these contests between these giant sloths and the saber-toothed tiger or the, the wolf, it might have been more common than those contests I described in the Kruger Park because these animals, I can't see how they would have escaped easily like down a burrow like a porcupine would or a honey badger would. A honey badger or a porcupine would like to get out of that encounter, but I can't see how these enormous animals would get out of it. So assuming that that's true, surely these encounters are happening frequently and, and perhaps the the predators were only able to take the sick or the the young because if they were able to easily take an adult i would assume that those adults wouldn't have survived um easily because they they're so exposed yes now i think i think the the um the idea that um much of the carnivory in the protopampus was on juveniles is a very valid one. I mean, for example, in our in our pampas too, we may have given listeners a slightly wrong impression by implying that Smilodon populator targeted mainly adult mega herbivores. Now, it was certainly capable in, in certain circumstances of slaying adult mega herbivores, but probably what it did was it targeted the juveniles. So, for example, a, a, you know, a, a notiomastodon elephant-like animal in the proto pampas weighed more or less the same as modern elephants, but it had juveniles that weighed, you know, um, less than a ton. And and those were probably the ones that the Smilodon was after. Similarly, with the with the uh, the South American species of the dire wolf, the, the animal is probably largely targeting juveniles of the Xenarthrans. And the idea was to you know, to to get a situation where the juvenile was not completely under wraps by its mother and could be snatched and killed. Now, in the case of 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 Smilodon, maybe the way it operated was to kill the juvenile and then to get out of the situation. Because it would it would be subject to retaliation and revenge. 
So just basically slay and leave and then come back because once the animal's dead, you know, eventually the mother's going to quit it. So getting in and slaying the baby is a great way to come back later for a meal. Um, the, the, the South American or the, the proto Pompeian dire wolf um, was a completely, uh, had a completely different predatory strategy from the saber toothed cat smiled on populator because it was um, unspecialized in terms of its dentition. It's really just like a, a, you know, twice as large version of a modern wolf with somewhat smaller paws and a larger, proportionately larger head and jaws and teeth. But it, it essentially hunted in the typical canid way, which is partly by um, hunting, you know, running after things and partly just from using the group to harass and mutilate an animal until it succumbs. So what I can imagine is that a group of, say, 20 or 10 uh, individuals of the proto-Pompeian dire wolf, Enosion eringi, would um, surround a xenarthron. Uh, it's difficult to imagine with a glyptodont because it was such a, a, an armored animal, you know, a fortress animal, but perhaps a ground sloth of medium size, say 250 kilograms, something like that. There were plenty of species like that in the protopampus. And then, you know, if it was a bad day for that sloth, maybe not not at full strength, they would just basically harry it and bite it and weaken it until it succumbed, particularly perhaps to the point of releasing it, the young that it was um, sheltering. So that that's an easy thing to imagine. Imagine here you have even go up to 400 kilos. Imagine you have a 400 kilo ground sloth and here come even just say five individuals of the dire wolf. OK, they know what they're doing. What they do is they basically harass that animal. They distress it and they bite it, which they can do from the back, even though that's not going to kill it. They bite it. They, you know, um, they worry it until it, it, it loses the strength of of uh, of, of the maternal uh, determination to keep its baby. And then the baby gets within reach and they'll take that and rip it apart instantly because the, the difference between the Smilodon and the dire wolf would be that the dire wolf could polish off prey in a matter of minutes just by ripping it apart. So, you know, these these predatory interactions are imaginable, but we don't have anything in the modern world to uh, to use as a template or a model when we're trying to envisage how the South American dire wolf would have approached these edentate prey, the glyptodonts, the pumpatheas, which were like large herbivorous armadillos and the um, and the ground sloths. So, so do you think some of these animals, um, the, the, the large uh, herbivores, would have ignored these predators much like an elephant or a rhino in the Kruger, you know, amble past a leopard or a lion, and they, they know there's no value in, in having an interaction? Um, or would the saber-toothed tiger always go up to a herbivore that it encounters to check out whether there's an angle here for, for a meal? Well, it's hard to say. Um, it's, it's hard to envisage that level of detail in the behavioral interactions, but um, mm. I dare say that the overall relationship was fairly similar, except that in the case of the xenarthrans, I can only imagine that these ground sloths, glyptodons, and pampatheas were basically just more or less, um, you know, just more or less uh, oblivious to the presence of predators, except for maybe mm. just clutching their young more tightly unto themselves. Mm -hmm. um, mm. I'm not sure how a glyptodon would protect its young. I have no idea. I've never thought about that because it doesn't mm. have the ability to hug it close to its chest in the way that a ground sloth can. Yeah. Presumably, the baby glyptodons were heavily armored right from the start. But you see, this is the sort of Achilles heel of being a heavily armored animal like a glyptodon is you have to start from babyhood. And if the animal can't embrace its young, um, mm. then you, know, you have the same vulnerable, vulnerability as you have in any juvenile creature, which is that its, its defenses are not fully formed. And so maybe mm. it's the case that with the glyptodons, the glyptodonts, I should call them, um, the main predation was on the juveniles and that those juveniles were soft or mm. thin shelled enough that the dire wolf in particular mm. could just basically crunch them up every now and again. And bear in mind that because the reproductive rate of all of these xenarthrans was so limited, mm. um, their rate of, of providing prey for the um, carnivores was also limited. 
So mm. we have to we have to assume that most of the prey for the dire wolf and for the smilodon and for the short uh, the deep faced bear was produced by the um, the mammal lineages with the faster pace of life, uh, the equids, yeah. the the um, the ruminants, and so on. And of course, Anthony, the trump card for this tourism company trying to get the guests into the protopampus would be uh, there's megafauna on top of that uh, this layer that we haven't discussed. I mean, we haven't even mentioned. You'll see herds of mammoths, etc. So perhaps you could remind the viewers of what this tourist would see. Just a, a quick overview, and then um, uh, switching tack after that, I, I, I thought perhaps we could return to this. A continental shelf and uh, as a possible way for explaining why the fauna has changed so much over the last 20,000 years and you know possible link to drought and uh, that would have the extreme droughts that may have occurred in the uh, late Pleistocene. Yes well just to tackle the first question first just to remind listeners that the mega herbivores, the uh, mammals more than one ton in body mass in the protopampas, were, um, if I recall correctly, I don't have the list right in front of me, but it was an elephant. It was many different genera and uh, several different families of, of uh, xenarthrans, edentates, enormous ground sloths up to elephant size, as well as, uh, you know, rhino size glyptodonts. Um, and then um, a macrochenia, which is a, a typically South American paraungulate, more than a ton. A large camel, uh, again, about a ton in body mass. Um, and um, an animal called toxodon, which is a deeply uh, South American, somewhat hippo or rhino-like paraungulate. Um, so that's the main list. So that, that is already spectacular enough. But again, many of those mega herbivores that we would like to um, to show to our our Serengeti-esque clientele would have been rather lumpen. I mean, the, they would have been big lumps, make no mistake. But a big four-ton lump is not all that engaging after you you know you switch off the engine and and point it out a bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> the elephants would have been as as interesting as any elephants anywhere. Yeah. But. Um, I'd say that the main drawback with the mega herbivores, although the mega herbivores in the protopampas were more diverse than those in the Serengeti today, they were also less active and therefore less interesting. Now, to come back to your other point, um, just remind me again, what was it? Uh, it's the, the continental shelf. And I'll, I'll throw in yes. another one, and that is uh, discussing what animals there are between 20 kilograms and 999 kilograms on the pampas today. I know there's the pampas deer and we, we need to uh, just cover that as, as well, I think, before we end our um, Yes, well, you see, that's a very podcast. easy one to do. I, 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 I agree that that's an important uh, uh, frame of reference. And it's very easy to do because there are only two mammals in the pampas today that are large, the indigenous mammals that are larger than 20 kilograms. And they are the capybara, which is actually restricted to the edges of the pampas, um, where it's particularly wet. And that's at the, you know, the southern distribution, southern limit of the distribution of the capybara. So it's not really a typical Pompeian animal in the modern fauna, although it does reach the pampas. And then there's the pampas deer, which is a negligible uh, ruminant in the sense that it's only 30 kilos, which in Africa wouldn't even be noticed. And it's not. It wasn't. It's not particularly gregarious. It's not migratory. It's a token deer um, that can't possibly account for much of the herbivory on the modern pampas. There was also nominally a small population of the Huanaco um, in a, in in the one mountain range, Sierra de la Ventana, in Buenos Aires province, where you have rocky slopes. But the Huanaco, although common in other parts of South America, did not. Um, did not occur on the flat, grassy plain of the Pampas when the Spaniards arrived. And so the modern fauna larger than 20 uh, kilograms is, is negligible um, in, in enormous distinction to what happened, you know, to what was present more than 10,000 years ago. Now, so the Pampas um, deer is about the size of an impala, is it? So, but it would, uh, would... It's smaller than an impala. Uh, an impala okay. has, has a female body size of about um, 
45 and the male body size of about 55, if I remember rightly. Um, and the 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 pampas deer is more like a a, um, a mountain reed buck. It's like a 30 kilogram animal. Uh, and it's a bit like the mountain reed buck in that it it it, it wouldn't occur in large herds like the impala does. It's in yes, that's, small, that's right. It's small more, groups. It's, it's, that's right. The mountain reedbuck is a pretty yeah. good um, animal to focus on, except, of course, that the mountain reedbuck likes, you know, fairly steep slopes. The pampas deer yeah. likes it flat. But in many other ways, even in appearance, they're kind of similar. And, yeah. you know, many, many aficionados of African wildlife, many people who, who take an interest in African wildlife wouldn't even have heard of a mountain reedbuck. Because in the bewildering diversity mm. of, of bovid ruminants in Africa, you don't even notice that animal. It's It's just a... It's kind of in the interstices, it just fills in. Um, so it's a truly impoverished fauna. Now, coming to your other point about to what degree the onset of dryness, or I wouldn't say aridity, but a drying aspect could account for the disappearance of the proto Pompeian spectacular fauna, it doesn't really ring true because the impoverishment of the South American large mammal fauna has occurred right across the spectrum from the deepest Amazon to Tierra del Fuego. There's just been a general impoverishment. There still are nominally a few interesting animals there. There, there are not one, but two species of tapir. There are, you know, a good half dozen species of deer. And um, there are peccaries. And uh, there are camelids in South America. So yeah. it's, there's a fairly respectable list of, of um, you know, ungulate animals in South America, but none of them really amount to much. And they're scarce, regardless of the environment. They're always, mm. you know, just a few here and a few there. And, um, you know, can't, can't really explain it. There's no real correlation um, between their incidence and, and climate, except that the Juanago, which is the most common ungulate in South America today, tends to prefer dry and cold areas, like the Andes and the southernmost reaches of Patagonia. Right. And, and what if we turn the argument completely on its head and say, well, with the coastal extent of that uh, continental shelf, um, there were parts of the Pampas during um, when that continental shelf extended 100 k's out to sea, perhaps part of the Pampas experienced extreme drought and it was beneficial to be a, a mobile large animal and that uh, competitive advantage is no longer there because uh, the extreme drought has disappeared. Is well, that's possible. Angle to uh, that? that is possible. But, you know, if you use modern South America as a, um, as a, as a frame of reference, we don't really find um, that happening in, for example, the Kachinga, the Kachinga being the kind of horn of South America, the far east of Brazil, um, yeah. south of the Amazon mouth, but north of the of the Cerrado. Uh, that that Kachinga area is not only dry but subject to episodic drought, um, and it, it basically has no ungulate fauna to speak of. I mean, you've just got a one or two small deer that you hardly notice. Um, there's no real large game response in the form of animals that move in, res in response to rainfall or anything like that. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's difficult. South America is a deeply puzzling place. It, it almost seems like nature has has decided to snub its nose at the idea that nature abhors a vacuum. Um, yeah. And so it tantalizes us because we, we neither can we say that it conforms to other continents, nor can we comfortably say that it has nothing of anything it's got plenty of something you know it's got it's got stuff it's got tapirs it's got camelids it's got deer it's got peccaries yeah. it's got yeah. stuff but the stuff doesn't doesn't really work it it, it, it leaves large vacua uh, mm. in, in the ecological situation that is and it fluctuated between being jam-packed um kind of observing the um, the rule that nature abhors a vacuum when it just shoved all those mega herbivores and others into that space for some time and now and now it's left with a vacuum in comparison. 
Is yes, and the there's, 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 there's no particular reason to, to think, maybe maybe this needs to be clarified, there's no particular reason to think that the protopampus of Buenos Aires province was particularly rich in large mammals. As far as we know, most of those large mammals we've discussed were fairly widespread in South America. Um, no, okay. Yes, yes. So, for example, the dire wolf uh, occurred also in Bolivia. Um, yeah. The various ground sloths occurred up through Brazil and so on. Um, oh, okay. So it's not like the, 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 the pampas necessarily had a large endemic fauna. It may have, mm. but, but, you know. There, there uh, was, so so we, we can't invoke the extreme nutrient richness of the pampas soils to explain that fauna because many of those animals occurred into nutrient poor soils up north. Is that right? Well, that, that's going a bit far, but what we can okay. say is that the patterns are not clear. You know, the patterns right. are not clear. So it's difficult. To, that's too too fine a level of resolution, uh, you know, to be upheld by the information available. Right. Um, yeah. And I, I'd just like to mention, uh, as a side note, something that, that was was trivial in the context of the, the ecological um, importance of the fauna on the proto-pampas, but it's kind of food for thought. Now, Strangely enough, there was a monkey in this fauna. Oh, right. A monkey called, the genus is called Protopithecus. It's in the okay. um, Ataline uh, clade of South American monkeys, which includes howler monkeys, woolly monkeys, and spider monkeys. But what's interesting about this monkey is that it's about the same size as modern baboons, about 23 kilograms. Now, with, with the modern Chakma baboon of uh, Southern Africa, you're dealing with um, an animal of similar body mass overall, even though the, the females and males are very different. The females are about 15 kilos and the males are 30 kilograms and more. But if you take an average, this monkey that lived in the protopampus in the late Pleistocene was about as big as the largest living monkeys. And that's quite impressive considering that monkeys in South America today are remarkably um, deficient in the sense that they don't live in open environments, open environments at all in comparison with Africa and India, where monkeys live in open environments. And they're also generally very small. American monkeys are remarkably small and in some cases miniaturized, like in the marmosets and the tamarinds. So what, what I'm driving at here is that there's something very odd about the primate situation in South America, because nominally speaking, South America has a bewildering diversity of primates, including extremely intelligent ones like the uh, the genus Cebus, the uh, capuchin monkeys. And yet there's at least three things that have not happened apparently at any time in the evolutionary history of South America that you would expect to happen based on Africa and Asia. Number one, you would expect humans to evolve. Nothing like that happened. Uh, neither apes nor anything like Homo evolved. Even though when you look at the faces of some of the South American monkeys, they are the most human-like of all monkeys in terms of their facial confirmation, their facial expressions, their, the exposure of the white of the eyes, and, 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 and that's backed up by the formidable intelligence of, of capuchins, uh, really interestingly intelligent animals, including tool-using animals. Secondly, there's no terrestrialization to speak of. There's nothing like a baboon um, in the South American monkey fauna, including the extinct forms. And, and thirdly, um, uh, there's no sort of gigantism involved. Because even though you do get a 23 kilogram monkey in the protopampus, you don't get anything like a great ape anywhere in that fauna. So just as I'm trying to tie two things together, just as it's a it's an unresolved puzzle as to why the bovids, the bovid ruminants, the uh, the bovines and the antelopes never came into South America at all. That's one kind of puzzle. That's a puzzle of recruitment. There was no recruitment by an enormous continent of a group of animals that should have just been able to walk in and take over. That's a puzzle of recruitment. But there's a puzzle of natural selection or evolution in the case of the primates, because you had all the primates there forever, at least in the forests, and yet they did nothing in terms of the trends we've seen in Africa and, and uh, Eurasia, in terms of terrestrialization, um, bipedality, mm. um, uh, gigantism, and eventually human evolution. Mm -hmm. a, human, a human species should have evolved in South America. Or we'll no, put no, it this way, if, if, if a human species evolved in the old world, why wouldn't it evolve in South America is the question.
To what extent did humans need bovids to evolve? Well, that's a that's a, a, a deep and complex question. Um, but my sort of off the cuff answer would be not. I mean, I think that. Okay. Yeah, I th it's hard to say. It's hard to say. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's possible, but you know, again, that's that's beyond beyond anything <laughs> one could really argue based on on uh, reason and evidence. Yeah, sure. No, absolutely. At very at very least, we should we should have had a, a terrestrial monkey in South America, something along the lines of a baboon. Why not? Yeah, Why not? and that that monkey in the fossil record you don't think was occurring out on the plains in a manner that the baboons do today in Africa? Well, they've studied its skeleton and, you know, it's related to a very arboreal group, the howlers, the okay. woolly monkeys, and the spider monkeys. And and it, right. it retained that essential character, but it was probably a bit like the modern um, vervet monkey, just bigger in the sense that it had some okay. terrestriality, but it was yeah. essentially dependent on trees for refuge and for forage. Okay. Wonderful, thanks. Well, we just we keep adding puzzles, um, uh, not answers, but the the puzzles are, are fun to dive into. So, well, yes, uh, yes. many thanks, Anthony. Look forward to uh, part four. What 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 are we going to do in part four? Well, I think we have to turn to the rodents now, which are in many ways okay. much more central to the whole puzzle of the pampas than all of these interesting digressions, because it's the rodents that. Um, ran the ecosystem when the Spanish arrived in 1516. And it's yeah. the rodents that remained, you know, until the, the pampas was farmed. And they they will lead us into an interesting discussion of the possibility, the strange possibility that a fauna composed virtually solely of rodents could have the same ecological power in terms mm -hmm. of energetics and and uh, and the food pyramid, as it were. Um, as as a as a spectacular mega herbivore fauna, mm. uh, that's a deeply counterintuitive possibility, but um, it would give us a possible explanation for how mm. um, there was not actually a vacuum in the Holocene it, and the Pampas. In, it, in, in that, in ecological yeah. terms, an alternative state is that right? An alternative state, in very much the same way, to come back full circle to our hypothesis that a grassland even if it's only yeah. knee high, can have as much ecological power as a forest 100 meters high. Deeply yeah. counterintuitive because we humans tend to associate power with big things. But yeah. power is not so much about big things, it's more about the rate of energy conversion. And so if a small yeah. plant or a small mammal can convert energy rapidly and intensely per unit area of land, then it can hypothetically achieve the same ecological power as a, a community of large organisms. And that in turn means it could be more competitive. So we're saying here that the grasses under certain circumstances can can be more powerful and therefore more competitive and outcompete and usurp the space of the trees. And the rodents can be as powerful as these mega herbivores and and outcompete them is 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 that the end conclusion? That that is exactly the idea. Uh, and in the case of yeah. the plants, I mean everybody really accepts this. Everybody knows that the prairies of the world, the steppes of Eurasia, the the high felt, um, yeah. and so on. It is a case. It is obviously the case that the grasses have yeah. outcompeted woody plants. There's no other way to explain it. Yeah. Uh, you can argue about how that's happened, whether it's fire or nutrients or whatever, but there, there obviously has been out competition, which is a very awkward yeah. term, but we know would be mean. Yeah. But nobody's yeah. really ever suggested that for for large animals. Nobody's ever really suggested that a, a rodent is analogous to a grass in being able to take over an entire prairie and basically kick yeah. out the big mammals <laughs> through just mm. simply the force of competition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Looking forward to that, and uh, thanks again. Thank you, and and um, to listeners, please um, uh, like, subscribe, and share with your friends, and we look forward to seeing you for Pampas 4, and we'll also be releasing various other items, um, including commentaries on brief videos involving predation and so on. So just uh, watch our channel, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in future, future items. So over and out from now. Cheers.